pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Vietnam Veterans News Podcast. News of interest about Vietnam veterans from a Vietnam veteran. Now, here's your host, Mac Payne. This is Mac Payne here with episode 1701 of the Vietnam Veteran News Podcast. News about the Vietnam War and the brave veterans who served there, as told to you by yours truly, and on this episode by a distinguished professor from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right there on the banks of the Bonangahela River. That is Dr. Bob Rodriguez. He has been contributing to this podcast from the class that he teaches there at Duquesne University about the Vietnam War and the Vietnam era. It has been very informative, and it's going to continue that way. In this episode, he's going to go into more detail about what happened at Binh Dien Phu back in 1954, when the Vietnamese communists went in there and kicked the French out of their country. Nobody believed they could do it, but they did. Bob's going to tell us all about it, especially about the sad thing that happened to the artillery commander there at Binh Dien Phu. Then he's going to go on and talk about the Geneva Convention. After things fell through for the French at Binh Dien Phu, several of the interested party countries decided to get together and decide what they were all going to do about Indochina. Bob goes into that in detail. It's very interesting. And again, I encourage you to have a pencil and paper nearby to take notes because he does a very good job of describing the situation in detail and you will want to be able to refer back to those notes when you're at a dinner party somewhere and you want to impress people with your knowledge of Indo-Chinese history. And again, there will be no exams at the end of Dr. Rodriguez's presentations. Without any further ado, get that pencil and pen ready, sit back, relax, and take in everything Dr. Rodriguez is about to tell you. All right, here we go. Hi, Mac. Glad to be back. Today, we're going to uh, start where we left off last time, and that is at the uh, epic battle of Dien Ben Phu. Officially, the battle started in March, March 12th of uh, 1954, and ended on May 7th. But actually, it had been uh, been going on earlier with skirmishes uh, in the area and so on. Dien Ben Phu is located in the northwest area of Vietnam. Okay, it is about 20 miles from Laos, the Laotian border. It lies in a valley uh, surrounded by uh, very rugged mountains, and many of them are uh, uh, tropical mountains you know, with high canopies and so on. The valley itself was about 10 miles long and about 5 miles wide. Uh, why it was uh, significant is because the Viet Minh, uh, these were the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese uh, revolutionary troops, had crossed through this valley into Laos because they were attempting to bring Laos into their control, you know, as well, not control in terms of a, a country, but in terms of communism. And the French thought, well, this is a good place to set up a base. We'll put a base here. Uh, we'll stop any of their movements. If they try to come across this 10 mile stretch, five miles from the width, uh, we'll slaughter them. And they built an extremely formidable 
base at Dien Bien Phu. And I say formidable because uh, if you go to interviews of the people who uh, who were part of the whole process at the time, they they almost unanimously say this is just you know one of the the best bases uh, could, could possibly have been built. Now, of course, there were errors. Uh, the man who was in charge of this was the French general Henri Navarre. That's N-A-V-A-R-R-E. And he was not a specialist in jungle warfare, but he was uh, in designing or putting together, uh, hopefully, a plan for what we call a set-piece battle. And he was a World War II veteran. So Dien Ben Phu was built uh, with airstrip was made of corrugated steel. And around it, there was a there was a river that ran through there. It was called the Nam Yun River. So what the French did is they built eight redoubts or areas of resistance. Okay, in other words, they were just big areas that would resist any main attempt against the main base at the Ben Phu. And this was to be totally an air base. Nothing at all could come in by land. It was too formidable. Uh, by land. And unfortunately, the closest French air support was 185 miles away. So that, that was not an advantage. I mean, that was a, not a you know real short flight. And to keep in mind, this is the 1950s technology. So they built this uh, uh, base at Dien Ben Phu, and they had the uh, eight readouts out there. Now, these readouts were not just single forts. They were forts that were clustered, and there may have been two or three uh, bases, okay? They actually came under the massive attack of the Viet, Viet Minh. In many ways, Dien Bien Phu is compared to World War I in the sense that it was trench warfare as well as barbed wire. Uh, the French had barbed wire all around the base, all around the readouts, etc. The uh, Viet Minh, they would charge, take massive losses, dig in, charge, more losses. It was like a noose going around the neck of the French. And so therefore, you almost have a almost a replica of some of the action that occurred in, in World War I. If you look at pictures of Dien Ben Phu, usually the aerial pictures, you can see that uh, it was, you know, it was pretty well laid out. Barbed wire was, the, again, the, the, the technology of the day, I guess, in terms of preservation. But in the hills above, and these were, again, formidable hills, the French did not believe at all that the Viet Minh could go into those hills, and yet they did. They dragged up their artillery. They used peasants to, uh, I mean, 10,000 peasants to crush stone to create roads. The peasants brought up uh, rice uh, to, the, to the military up there, and they dug in these, uh, uh, their artillery pieces into caves. The general in charge of the Viet Minh was a revered man by the name of Vo Win Ziap. And it's G-I-A-P is his last um, first name. Actually, he votes his first uh, last name. But he engineered the troops there. And his cave or his uh, base was about to 20 miles away from Dien Bien Phu and was very, very well secured and well hidden. Uh, a little just anecdote here. He had a little, little uh, he had some rooms and, and so on in there. But he also had a kitchen made of clay stoves and they rigged it up so that the exhaust fumes of these clay stoves were horizontal rather than uh, vertical. So th his area was never bombed. Okay, his area was never bombed yet. French planes obviously were looking for him. Other personalities of uh, Dien Ben Phu, the French leader there was Lieutenant Colonel and later became General uh, Ferdinand de Castries. This is a little side note, a little interesting note. He named all of the redoubts uh, after French women, and supposedly they were all his, uh, his, his lovers. And they had names such as Dominique. Elaine and Marie, Claudine, Huguette, and, and so on. But he is going to be the one who eventually will be a surrender on uh, May the 7th of 1954. On the first day of the battle, 
which was uh, technically uh, March 12th, the Viet Minh just pounded uh, Dien Bien Phu, and they, they put holes, potholes in the runways, and this just pretty much dismantled uh, the air. From then on, it pretty much had to be parachute drops. And parachute drops were, um, they were uh, a danger because oftentimes because of the, they could, they could not get in close enough because of anti-aircraft fire by the Viet Minh. So sometimes when they would drop their provisions, they would fall into the hands of the Viet Minh. So this became a cat and mouse game uh, once uh, this uh, the, you know, the aerial part was pretty much destroyed because of the runway. The man in charge of the French artillery was Colonel Peroth, who had unfortunately bragged very vociferously about the fact that the Viet Minh guns could never reach Dien Bien Phu. Well, on the first day when they pounded Dien Bien Phu in the runway, Colonel Peroth committed suicide. Uh, he, uh, you know, he went into his hooch. And he pulled the pin on a grenade and he blew himself up. It was to him, he said, uh, too embarrassing, too demoralizing. Another, of course, uh, figure of uh, Dien Bien Phu would be uh, Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was in contact with Bo Zin Ziap uh, throughout it because he knew that this was going to be, uh, or they felt it was going to be the final uh, battle of the French war. Why? Because by now the French were pretty much exhausted and this was not a well-received war, you know, at home. Uh, in fact, at home, it was called the dirty war. As you're going to see when the Dien Bien vets return after Dien Bien Phu, those who made it out, by the way, 70% are going to die on the prisoner of war march, an incredible number. And I'll mention a little bit about that later. But when these remaining soldiers returned home, uh, they were coming off the, the gangplanks and they were being stoned by the longshoremen and cussed and mocked. This was very similar to the way American uh, Vietnam soldiers were treated after, war, after the Vietnam War. Most of them just went into obscurity. They suffered from physical and psychic disorders. They were uh, given a runaround by the French government in terms of any pensions, et cetera. It was, it was really a travesty. And, and interesting, as I said enough, this was replicated 20 years later in the United States. The significance of Dien Bien Phu, I think, is threefold. Number one, it's going to end the French occupation of Indochina. As I said, they're exhausted. They've had it. Even the United States went in and says, look, we'll continue to support you with money and materiel. And the French said, no. OK, we, we, we reached the end. And the uh, the attitude at home, the French people were very, very much anti-war. OK, and again, perhaps a parallel to what was going on in the United States back in 1967, 68, 69 in the early 70s. Uh, in regard to the uh, protests against the war. The second significance of Dien Bien Phu is that it signaled, and this is probably most important for the, United, for the United States, it signaled to us that we needed to take up where the French ended. Not for colonial gain, okay? Again, I think empires were beginning to collapse. It was very clear. Uh, even the United States had given up the Philippines in 1946, you know, willingly, I mean, just, you know, here, Filipino independence, because we realized that the day of empires had gone and the day of nations had arisen. But a signal to us was Cold War implications. Uh, and that was the domino theory, which we talked about last time. Uh, we felt certain that we had to step in and stop the, the fall of all these dominoes in Southeast Asia. The third significance of Dem Ben Phu, it, it actually provided a new model of modern warfare. Uh, in which size, sophistication, and uh, I guess pure firepower didn't always dictate victory. We'll talk about some uh, bomb statistics that were done uh, later with regard to American prosecution of the war in Vietnam. And you'll see that they were, for the most part, impressive in number, but uh, not successful in, uh, in, in practice. Well, what followed right after uh, Dien Bien Phu uh, 
and was already in the works, was something called the Geneva Convention. And it had an array of uh, issues to deal with in the international scene. However, of course, uh, the French defeat at, uh, uh, in Vietnam was one of them. There were seven nations represented at the Geneva Convention. By that, I mean at the tables. And these seven nations were Laos, Cambodia, the government of South Vietnam, which at the time was still run by an emperor by the name of Bao Dai, the Viet Minh, North, China, the Soviet Union, and of course, France. Notice the United States was not there. We were there, but we were in the background. We sat in the back. Our ambassadors there, our representatives there were told not to say a word. And there was purpose in this. And the purpose is, or was, is that we did not want to be held accountable for any of the provisions that were going to be decided at Geneva. Okay, So American um, representatives just kind of sat there and gnashed their teeth because they could not participate and only be an observer. Geneva had five main accords, okay? Number one, uh, they were reached between uh, March and July of 54, and this was the future of Vietnam, okay? That was the first thing. And what they were going to decide uh, in Vietnam was that in 1956, this is another provision, there would be free elections in Vietnam to unify the country. Uh, and these elections would take place uh, again in 1956, and they would then uh, eliminate the break at the 17th parallel. Uh, the accords were marred by a lot of Cold War paranoia. I mean, we had just experienced Korea, and of course now the French in, in Vietnam. So things were at a, a pretty high pitch. Soldiers from the North and South Vietnamese were told to return to their place of origin. So you had this big shift, shifts in human population and even the civilians relocating from the North to the South. Uh, and this just became a um, humanitarian issue as well. In 1955, this was before the 56 date in which they were to unify Vietnam, the South Vietnamese held an election, okay? An election uh, was a free election, and the two candidates were Bao Dai, the emperor, and a little-known nationalist by the name of No Din Zim. I'll spell it, N-G-O is his first, uh, or the bracket, rather his last name. Uh, his middle name is D-I-N-H, Din and the uh, first name is D I E M, spelled like Z or pronounced like Z M. Now, Z M won the election handedly, something like 98.5% of the vote. Now, much of this was brought on by an OSS officer by the name of Edward Lansdale. Edward Lansdale was. Um, a mischievous, uh, very accomplished agent, under agent. Uh, he had been very successful in the Philippines in putting a pro-U.S. government in power there, and now he shifted his attention to Vietnam. And here's what a little interesting story in regard to that 1955 election that Bao Dai lost so handedly to No Din Diem, is that Lansdale maneuvered to have the ballots colorized, okay? assuming that most Vietnamese were not uh, uh, literate and therefore couldn't read it, so they made it by color. The color that he used for No Din Diem was red, and the color that was used for Bao Dai was green. Now, as it turns out, in Vietnam, Red is the color of luck, and green is the color of jealousy or lust. So this was a Lansdale ploy to put No Din Diem in power, and he was successful. He did urge Diem not to announce 
the final tally of 98.5. He says, you know, make it in the 70s, make it more believable. But no, Dinsiem said no. He did, he did announce the 98.5. So that's a little understory. But no, Dinsiem now is the premier of South Vietnam in 55. When we come to the deadline for the 1956 elections, it was very, very apparent that Ho Chi Minh was going to win. He was probably going to win with about 80% of the vote against No Dinh Diem. So this is where the United States ploy in Geneva had worked. Since we were not part of the Geneva agreements, we agreed with No Dinh Diem not to hold the elections. So the South Vietnam area denied the elections, they were never held, and the United States said this on the basis that we never agreed to this at Geneva. And by now, the United States had moved in as advisors to the South Vietnamese government. It came in the form of MAG, Military Assistance and Advisory Group. These were advisors who came in and trained Vietnamese troops actually called ARVN, A-R-V-N, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, began to train them in, in military tactics, in um, uh, firepower, in um, equipment, and, uh, and equip them very well uh, from the United States standpoint. So that's the point we are right now. And we begin the regime of no DNZM. This is a critical juncture. Because when you look at the whole Vietnamese picture, the whole Vietnam War picture, many historians believe that this was the one chance that the United States had to perhaps have uh, been victorious in Vietnam with supporting No Dinh Diem. Now, that's under a lot of conjecture, and we'll talk about that in the next time. So, Mac, we'll see you the next time, and uh, and happy sailings. Thank you very much, Bob, for that description of what happened at Ben Dien Phu and then the Geneva Convention. I look forward to you telling us about the sad story of No Dien Diem, the unfortunate first president of South Vietnam, in the next episode. I can hardly wait. With that, I'm going to close this episode of the Vietnam Veteran News Podcast and encourage you all to not miss episode number 1702, where Bob Rodriguez will be telling us all about ZM and the pathetic way that he left office. Thank you for listening. You are encouraged to come back soon and often to the Vietnam Veteran News Podcast. How about that? Ain't that a mess?